You know, God has been sharing a lot of things in the last couple of weeks. It seems like the more sometimes that God shares, have you ever felt like this? The devil just tries to move in to to steal that which God has been doing. And I've kind of felt like that this week. We've had, uh, we've had, we've seen God do some great things. And at the, the same time, it's like somehow or another, a hornet's nest has gotten kicked and and I've been praying this morning. I feel like I've been sitting there with a can of hornet spray and, and just spraying a lot of things. Uh, but how many know God's good? And it doesn't matter that there's stability and that there's peace in the kingdom. I started out this morning by beginning to pull up my message for this morning, and behold, it was gone. And so I've tried to reconstruct it the best I could in, in a hurry this morning. So it, if I deviate from my notes, maybe it's the Holy Spirit trying to, re, to remind me what I had written later on this week. One of the things that I, I believe that God has been speaking to me, and this is something he uh, spoke to me uh, last week during the service, and I wrote it down and I forgot to share it with you. Uh, how many know there's, there are very possibly some tumultuous times ahead? I mean, you're, you, you look at it. Uh, you look at what's going on financially. You look at what's going on uh, just with civil unrest worldwide. And one thing that God spoke to my heart, he said that we need to uh, pray for the protection of the nation of Israel like never before. Uh, it seems like, I, I don't know why everybody in the world just wants to possess that piece of ground and, and wants to take it over. It's smaller than Rhode Island, but you, you see, when, when God puts his finger in a place, the enemy just insists that he wants it. But one of the things that God promised me is uh, to the same proportion that we pray for their protection, God's protection will be released in our own lives. And uh, I think that's a prophetic word for this hour. I think daily that we need to pray for Jerusalem. That's a command of the Apostle Paul to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. But as we pray protection over the people of God, how me know that whatever you sow, that shall you also reap. And so God's speaking that in this day and this hour. If you have your Bibles, let's go to Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus 23 is the feast chapter of the Word of God, explains them, and the command of God to, uh, to observe them. And how many know they're all about Jesus? Every single one of them. I'll give you time to find it this morning. Leviticus 23, starting with verse 33. Then the Lord spake to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, The fifteenth day of this seventh month shall be the feast of tabernacles for seven days to the Lord. On the first day there shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. For seven days you shall uh, offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. And on the eighth day you shall have a holy convocation. And you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering, and a grain offering, and a sacrifice, and a drink offering, everything on its day, besides the Sabbaths of the Lord, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your freewill offerings, which you give to the Lord, Also on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. For on the first day shall be a Sabbath rest, and on the eighth day shall be a Sabbath rest. And you shall make for yourself on the first day of the the fruit of of beautiful trees, branches of the palm trees, the burrows of leafy trees, and the willows of the brook. And ye shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. And you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. And it shall be a statute, how long? Forever in your generations. And you shall celebrate it on the seventh month. And ye shall dwell in booths for seven days. All who are native born shall dwell in booths, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel to dwell in booths when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared the feast of the of Israel, or the, the feast to the children of Israel, the feast of the Lord. Now I, I just want to give first of all before we get into what I really want to get into this morning, uh, we need to have this day an overview of tabernacles. Uh, most of the church really doesn't understand. You know, when you begin telling them, "Well, I, I do the feast according to the word," uh, it, it seems like Christians ought to know them. You know, it's in the Bible. We seem to be 
uh, very fluent in the things that aren't in the Bible. And although we claim to be people of the book, we, we tend to be ignorant if it doesn't fall before Matthew. And isn't it, isn't it a shame the Apostle Paul was limited? He only had Genesis through Malachi when he was doing all the things we see him doing in the book of Acts and all the wonderful writings that we had in the New Testament uh, that he had to draw from the Old Testament to write them all. And yet we choose to be ignorant of the very things that he drew inspiration from and he drew insight from. The very first thing that we need to understand is that the Feast of Tabernacle lasts for eight days. It is, it is actually, it's seven, but then there's the last great day, the eighth day. Uh, seven days are described in verse 34, and then in verse 39, God adds an extra day. Seven, biblically, is the number that illustrates God's salvation plan. And it's not just the salvation of our souls. How many know that, that the, the salvation plan includes all of mankind? It includes the very planet. The Bible says that the, the, very, uh, that the earth itself is groaning, waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. It's like the earth is sitting there saying, man, you know all the damage you're doing to me? You know all the stuff that I've got to put up with because of sin in the earth? I'm kind of groaning to the day when everybody that dwells on me are all children of God and start taking care of me. And we, we need to understand that everybody's, you know, everybody's getting into being green you know, and, and protect the earth. We don't understand that for, for what damage we see from, from all the chemicals that we dump and all the stuff that we dump, sin destroys the very fabric of the universe. That although we need to understand that what we see in the natural with pollution, sin does in the spirit realm. Because you can, I mean, you can have a wonderful planet, you can have it clean with, with bubbling beautiful brooks, and then every family that's there is torn apart and that there's, there's chaos and there's woundedness and uh, there has to be a balance in both. That God has a plan for all the nations. God has a plan for all of mankind. He wants to bring them to salvation, that there would be no war, that there, there would be no sin. There, we wouldn't have to have cops on every street just to keep people uh, from stealing you blind and beating you up and, and just all the things that are going on. I, I, I'm amazed when I turn on the news that how, how crime is, is just on the rise in every single area. People that, uh, that used to be decent, when you put them a little under a little pressure, they, they seem to kind of lose their decency. I read years ago, it's a, a quote that this kind of has stuck with me, that, that what we call uh, civilized civilization is really a thin veneer, and it is pierced quite easily. The only ones that that doesn't pierce is those that are saved because no matter how deep you go in us, you find the deep kingdom of God. But for people that aren't in the kingdom, what we call civility uh, is a very thin veneer for them. Very unstable. And all it takes is the devil poking them to, to bring chaos out. But there's coming a time, God says, when I finish this thing up, that no matter how far you poke, you find peace. And that, that's part of the, the salvation plan. It's not just of man, but it's for, for all of creation. And number eight is the number of new beginnings. Not only of uh, salvation, and, and seven speaks of the millennial reign, but eight speaks of the new heaven and new earth. That God has a plan and that when he's done with it, we're going to, this universe is going to cease to exist and God's going to create a universe for us to dwell in. A new dimensional reality, if you will, that has never been touched by sin. That has, that never has sickness and disease, that never has all these things. I don't know about you, but I'm looking forward to it. Man is given 6,000 years for his reign on the earth and the seventh millennium is the millennial reign of Messiah. I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to that. When you, when you look at, some people try to tell us we've been here for millions of years. No, it only took us 6,000 years to screw it up as bad as it is. And that's all we really need is 6,000 years. But just as we see in creation that God rested on the seventh day, that seventh day is a divine rehearsal of the millennial reign. And when Jesus comes and rules and reigns for 1,000 years, unprecedented peace. I plan on having pet animals that you really can't have right now in my backyard during that time. 
The Bible says that the lamb's going to be able to lay down by the lion, that even a baby could play at an adder's hole, and adder's one of the most deadliest of all snakes. And that peace, I'm looking forward to that time that we can turn our, our spears into plowshares and our, our swords into pruning hooks. And, but right now, the way the world is, you almost need to do the reverse, don't you? Because the only one who's going to bring that is Messiah. What's also interesting about this time of year, this time of year is the time of year that Jesus was really born. Isn't it interesting how the world takes us out of sync with the kingdom? When you show people that uh, what we call Christmas has been celebrated for over 3,000 years, I've, I've got a, a real neat book written by a guy who used to be one of the major editors for Time Life magazine, and he just thought it was wonderful. Hey, 3,000 years of Christmas. I'm thinking, well, <laughs> did I get my calendar wrong? You know, was Jesus born 1,000 years before we thought he was? But, and that when you actually go back into it, Apollos was born on December 25th. Every pagan sun god was born on December 25th. But it was this time of year that Jesus was born. It's very fitting prophetically because God came and tabernacled among us. He was Emmanuel, God with us. And he walked with us for 33 years. I also want to look at verse 40 and just bring out some interesting things because there, there's lessons in, in the lulav. The lulav is the branches that they bound together because we need to understand that no matter where we are in our spiritual walk with God, we have got to have God tabernacling with us. Uh, the peace that I have in my life and the peace that, uh, that we need for this day and this hour, is the, the only surety can't come from the government. I mean, they can't agree on anything. Let's spin, let's save. One, one side says tomato, the other side is not saying tomato. They're, they're saying rutabaga or something. They can't agree on anything. And for some reason, we haven't caught on to the fact they created the mess that we're in. They literally created it. And so, you know, if, 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 some, if, if you give somebody dynamite and they blow up every building that they ever get a hold you don't make them in charge of investigating those who blow up buildings. It's impossible. It's going to have to come from something greater than the world, and it's going to come from God. Notice in verse 40, it says, And you shall take for yourselves on the first day the fruit of the beautiful trees, the branches of palm trees and the burrow of leafy trees and the willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God seven days. The waving of the lulav shows us the state of various members of the community of faith. How many know that when we all come to God, we're not instantly perfect? You know, if you're like me, when, when Jesus came into your life, he, he, he um, saved your soul, but you're still a mess. There's still things in your life that you've got to work out. Your spirit is where it needs to be with God, but it's all, it's, 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 we need a, a check up from the neck up. We, we, we still have baggage that we brought that's of the soul and of the mind. The palm bears fruit or it has deeds, but it has, it's not fragrant, which talks about spiritual blessings. This is a person who lives by the letter of the law, but does not have compassion or love for others. Have we seen people like that in the church? Boy, I mean, they're, they're a stickler for every little thing, but there's no compassion. And they, they, they almost have like a religious spirit. That it, they, and I, I don't know, I've been to churches that they kind of look you over. You know, you come in the door and they, they, they kind of have this lazy eye that just kind of looks you over. And then they, they have their doctrinal creeds back here on the wall. And they check to make sure you line up. And, and you've, you, I mean, you got to wear a tie. Men got to wear suits. Women are only allowed to wear dresses. Can't have any facial hair. I've yet to find that one really in the Word of God, but you can't have any facial hair. You have to have your hair cut just so, and you got to have all your little ducks in a row. And if you don't, then you're not a part of this fellowship. They're a bunch of palms. They always get the letter of the law. Do you know from the school that the Apostle Paul came from, there's, there were two schools of Pharisees back then, the school of Shammai and the school of Hillel. Paul was of the school of Hillel. The school of Shammai, its motto was the letter of the law. 
That's why we had problems in the book of Galatians, and, and we, we, that's why when the apostle Paul said, the letter of the law killeth, he was actually taking his hand and slapping the Shammai Pharisees upside the head that were causing all the problems in the church, and he said, but it's the, the spirit of the law gives life. The palm branch is only interested in the letter of the law, that if you don't dress exactly right and you don't just talk exactly right and you, just, you, you don't do everything, just, just cross every T, dot every I, that they can't have fellowship with you. And so there, there's no love and compassion there. The myrtle, the myrtle only has fragrance, but it, bears, but it can't bear fruit. It is like a person who is so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. They may recite scriptures, but they can't produce any fruit. And you've us known believers that you, you couldn't really see any fruit in their life, but man, I tell you what, they'd take the Word of God and they'd quote it from one end to the other. You know, I would rather find someone that knows two or three scriptures by heart and actually lives it. To actually live what you find here in this Word. I reminded years ago, I was reading a, a minister and he had a vast library and, and had a lot of knowledge and he, he was out one day on, on the poor side of town and there was an old street preacher and he said, he goes, I could feel the presence of God when, when I came down that, that place. And, and he, was, he was calling hobos and homeless and prostitutes and everything else to the Lord. He said, it was like a street revival. And uh, he said, and, and then I began to feel conviction myself. And I said, Lord, what, 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 what's the conviction? He said, go, go talk to him. And uh, as he went to talk to him, the, the man didn't have a high school education. He had been homeless, he had gotten saved, and he had been given one little book besides the Bible that he kept in his pocket. And he said he, he, said he could pull it out and, and show you pages and put them back in place. And it was about salvation and just the basic elementary things of walking with Christ. It was but more than a 100-page book. And uh, they began, well, where'd you go to school? I didn't go to school. Uh, well, how, how, did, how did you learn to get that anointing? He said, well, he said, I read the Bible, and he said, years ago after I got saved, I asked God to really give me what I needed, and he gave me this one little book. And he said, I read through it every day, and I have determined that everything from and between cover to cover, I'm going to live. It wasn't enough just to memorize it. I was actually going to live it. And he said, the convicting power of the Holy Spirit came on him and said, which one of you is a better servant? He's got one little book that he adds to the Bible that shows him how to live the Word of God. And he has dedicated his life to doing those 99 pages. And you have a library with thousands of volumes, but show me just one page that you have committed yourself to live. That's the Myrtle Branch. We've got to know and we've got to do. The willow. The willow will neither produce fruit nor fragrance. It is like a person who is intrigued by different doctrines but never produce fruit. Seems like there's Christians running after every new thing. Every new thing. But then when it comes time for them to produce fruit, they're off to the next new thing. Guys, we need to strive to be a, a citron. The citron... Uh, produces both fruit and fragrance. It is like a, a uh, faithful believer who lives in a balanced life in wisdom before God and man. They strive to know the word and to do the word. They strive to, to have deeds and to have spiritual fruit in their lives. Now see, the, the interesting thing is with this, we, we find all four in the body of Christ. We find all four. But they're all bundled together. And when they worship the Lord with them, they'll bundle them together and they'll begin worshiping and saying, Hosanna, Lord, save us. You see, no matter which position you're in, you need Jesus. No matter, no matter where you are in this journey of faith, you got to have him. We, we are reminded this time of year that, we are, that our lives are all about tabernacling with God. God said that, that he would come and he would walk with us and be with us and that we're not to touch the unclean so that he can in, his presence can be manifested in our lives. That's what brings stability to a home. It's not being religious. 
is not going to church every week. And, and sometimes I see the people, and, and how many know I've been in this thing for a long time, and I travel quite a bit, and I've seen, been to a lot of different churches. And sometimes the ones that put on the biggest front, that shout the loudest, that hoop and holler the loudest, are the ones that go home and sin the most during the week. But what God is saying, it's when you learn to tabernacle with me. Because in that tabernacling, his rule and his reign comes down into our lives and begins to bring stability. It's not the letter of the law. It's not being religious. It's being spiritual. Because it causes us to love when we need to love. It causes us to have words of encouragement. We need to have words of encouragement. His presence begins to, to help us overcome all of our idiosyncrasies and, and all of our hang-ups. Because most of us, guys, in our lives, our problems were caused by other people wounding us. Come on. It, it, it was caused by the failures of others when we were growing up. It was caused by those that we trusted that proved to be untrustworthy. But when God begins to move and begins to tabernacle with us, and no matter where we are in this, we say, Jesus, I need you. I need your presence in my life. I need you to be established in my home and in my life. He begins to bring healing in my life, and I can break the cycle. You see, the paradox is wounded people wound people. Very seldom do you see a whole person, someone who has, has received the healing of God, they become agents of healing. They're the ones that say, well, let's just settle down and let's, let's just look at the right way that we need to do this. Well, the, the person who's wounded, you hit that wound, what do they do? They go off, don't they? And what we don't realize is that in our flinging around from the pain, we're hurting and we're wounding others. Jesus wants to bring stability there. That's why this time, all of us, no matter where we are, it's Lord Hosanna, Lord, come save me. Come, come bring stability. Help me with my wounds because I want them healed so that I don't wound somebody else, so that I, don't, so that I become an agent of, of stability and not chaos. But I want to zero in right now on where God has us. Uh, this is the time of year that God begins to speak and God begins to share with us so that we can kind of prepare for the days ahead. And when you look at the Hebrew calendar where we are this year, uh, it's, it's actually represented by two Hebrew letters, the ayin and the aleph, and I've shared this just a little bit before. Ayin uh, means I or God. God is beginning to draw his attention to something. Aleph means strength or ox. And I really believe that this year there's two things that, uh, that God's attention is drawn to that we need to pay particular attention to. Number one, God's attention is toward restoring the strength of the remnant. God wants to restore our strength because life's hard. And not only does God want to bind up our wounds, but he wants to strengthen us back so that we can fulfill our purposes in the earth. And one of the things that I, I really want in my life, for every time that I've done something stupid, that I've hurt somebody, Lord, give me the strength to do twice as many things good to strengthen somebody so that I no longer hurt anyone, but by words and my actions will strengthen and bring stability. To do that, you've got to be made strong yourself. It's one thing for your body to, uh, for a wound to be healed. It's another thing for the body to be strengthened after the, after the healing of the wound. And God is saying, not only do I want to heal up your wounds, but I want to strengthen you for this day and this hour. The second thing that God is beginning to draw his attention to, he's getting ready to show himself strong in the earth. It, it's almost, it, it, if, if I could give this um, scenario, it, it's, it's like kids that were left alone too long by themselves at home. How many know that's when you have the, the curtains tore up. That's when you have the living room. That's a mess. That's, if, you, if you leave them too long, they, probably, they may even burn down your house. You just, especially if they're boys, you just never know. But something happens when daddy comes home. There's something happened when the parents come home and he begins to reestablish order. 
And for a long time, I really believe that God has, in a sense, drawn some of his presence away from the earth just to, because the Bible says that, that we got to believe that God is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. That means there are times that he draws back, and are we going to be faithful to him to continue seeking him, or are we going to find replacements? We're going to find other things to fill in the gap. We're going to, we're going to try to fill in the, the presence of God by going into esoteric things. Uh, I, I'm really alarmed at the amount of, of those that claim to be prophetic in the body of Christ that are leaning more on Kabbalah than they are the Word of God. Or hype. Golly, I hate hype. I'd just rather sit here and, and preach like droopy dog than to, than to try to work something up to have hype because it gets you excited. It gets your flesh all worked up. And when you leave, you don't have anything. I would rather... What God does, God does because God did it, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to use uh, psychology on you. I'm not trying to use all these different things on you just to work up the flesh. I want it to be real. I want it to be strong, and I want it to strengthen you so that when you walk out that you have something that you can deposit with you. And I really believe, in fact, this scripture or this, this set of scriptures, remember me telling you that Isaiah is becoming important again? I want to go to Isaiah chapter 35, and this, this is a short chapter. It's only 10 verses, but I really believe this is, this is one that you need to meditate on and read once a day. It'll take you less than four or five minutes to read this once a day, but then keep a journal as God begins to show things to you. Now, this is speaking of when the Lord returns, and how many know that there, there, are, there are patterns? God always follows the same pattern when he judges. One of the things that we have discovered in, in the last couple of weeks, uh, thanks to Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, is that the very same pattern that God used to judge the northern tribes, when he began to warn them, is being fulfilled today, and it started with 9-11, that they, not only did we see in 9-11, not only did we see Isaiah 9-10, but we had officials of the government get up and quote the words of defiance that God had speak in their mouths. I mean, so we're seeing Isaiah is beginning that, that same pattern. It's not the ultimate judgment, but as God's judge, it's the same pattern. And so when God begins to move to restore, it's the same pattern. Starting with verse, and the wilderness and the solitary place shall be glad for them. The desert shall rejoice and blossom as the rose. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice even with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given unto it, the excellency of Carmel and Sharon. And they shall see the glory of the Lord and the excellency of our God. Verse 3 and verse 4 you really need to meditate on. Strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them that are of a fearful heart, be strong, fear not, behold, your God will come with vengeance, even God with a recompense. He shall come and save you. Now, before I read on, I'll, can, I, can I just throw in a, a thing here? Anytime God comes to begin to restore strength, when God has to begin to judge some things, it's because his people have grown weak. It's because the, 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 um, this, the situation in the earth has gotten so bad that it has wore out the saints. And so you always see in the same pattern that when God begins to come, God begins to come because we need him to come. But we see several things here. We see, he is, strengthen ye the weak hands and confirm the feeble knees. Say to them, they are of a filthful heart. Be strong, fear not. Behold, your God shall come with what? Vengeance. God's getting ready to judge some things in the earth, and the reason he's got to judge them is so that you can get strength. Did you know any time a cop takes a mass murderer, or a serial carol off the streets and stands them before a judge, that it is vengeance and there is justice there, but how many know that it's peace to the community? And there's some things right now that God's got to judge in the earth so that he can bring stability and strength back to those that are his. He's got to do it. Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then shall the lame man leap as a heart in the tongue of the, dumb, of the dumb sing. For in the wilderness shall water break forth and the streams in the desert. 
And the parched ground shall become a pool in the thirsty land, uh, springs of water. And the habitation of dragons, where each lay shall grass shall be with grass, with reeds and brushes. And a highway shall be there, a way, and it shall be called the way of holiness. Underline that in your Bible, the way of holiness. What God's getting ready to do then this next year, he's going to reestablish a way of holiness for his people. That way of holiness is extremely important because look what is said next. And the unclean shall not pass over it, be it, but it shall be for those, the wayfaring men, though fools, shall not err therein. In other words, this path shall be a path that as we begin to walk in it, that a new level of divine protection is going to be on those, that God is establishing the paths to walk in, and that path of power is that you're going to walk in true biblical holiness, and it's going to become a guard around you for the other things that are happening in the earth. No lion shall be there or any ravenous beast shall go up uh, upon thereon, and it shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. But the redeemed shall walk there. But the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with songs and with everlasting joy upon their head. They shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Now, how many know that's, that is, that is, uh, that's talking about not only when Jesus comes, but it's talking about the visitation of God that we're getting ready to enter into. Because Almighty God is coming down to see what man's doing. He's coming down to see. And as I've shared before, when you look at that, he came down to see Sodom and Gomorrah. He came down to see the Tower of Babel to see if these things be so. He came down to Egypt to see. Amen. He came, I mean, he came down to see. God is coming down to see. He, 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 he backed off his hands for a while and said, okay, I'm going to see what you're going to do with this. Well, we've turned Christianity into a circus. We've turned it into a circus. We've turned it into hype. We've turned it into building little kingdoms instead of the kingdom of God. We've allowed evil to take over as long as they didn't mess with us. We've not stood up for righteousness the way that we should have. There are a lot of things that, that have happened over the, over the last few decades that if the body of Christ would have been doing what we should have been doing, we would have been the ones protesting in the streets and not rest until some things turned around. They took prayer out of schools. Where were the protests? Roe versus Wade, where was the protest? How many know that we have been on a downhill slide ever since they took prayer out of school? We've had presidents assassinated. We, the, this, all the different things that have gone on. In fact, it was even in the 60s that America was taken off the gold standard. If you don't understand finances, you don't know what that means. That was the very beginning of, a, of an economic collapse. Because if you take this piece of paper, Ben, see this piece of paper? This is worth $10,000. Now, I have nothing to back it up, but I promise you, just take me at my word, although I have been known to exaggerate most of the time, this is worth $10,000. That's what you have in your wallet. They put the seal on taking apart the very financial blessing of this nation when they did that. That was all done after they took prayer out of school, after we cheapened life. And if the body of Christ would have said, hey, you know what? We're voting you all out of office. We're going to protest in the streets. And if we got to, we got to replace the Supreme Court, we're going to replace the Supreme Court. We just sat there and we were quiet. Didn't say a thing. And the whole time ever since then, the body of Christ has been getting weaker and weaker and weaker. There was a time in this nation that politicians feared the body of Christ. Now they mock it openly. Now it's like if a politician gets up and says, I'm a Christian, oh, you're marginalized. But if you're a weirdo, we'll just set you over there. Now you can be a new ager and, and kiss crystals and everything else, and they'll just kind of set you up on a pedestal but not if you're walking in the ways of God. Guys, we need to meditate on this scripture. We need to get it deep in our heart because as we do, we're going to see God fulfill that word this next year in our lives. That he's going to begin strengthening us. You know what that makes us do? That makes us make better decisions. 
how many of us have had to walk through two or three or four years of a stupid decision that we had made? Yeah, some of us, 10, 15, 20 years <laughs> of a stupid decision that we had made, whether it's financial, relational, <laughs> uh, sky's the limit. But as we begin walking with God and, we, and he begins to tabernacle with us, we start making little decisions right that begin putting things to place in our life that we start making big decisions right. I found out in my own life the devil's not my biggest problem. I stare at my biggest problem every morning in the mirror when I brush my teeth and I comb my hair. If I can get that guy in the mirror to start doing the right thing, my life gets so much better. Man. If I, if I start building relationships instead of burning bridges, if I quit thinking that I got I, I to have this and I got to have that, you know what I got to have? I've got to have God tabernacling within. Because you can have the biggest house, you can have a mansion, you can have all the stuff in the world. But how many know that you're left empty with all of that? It's having God within. It's, it's having the peace and the kingdom of God, Jesus ruling and living in your heart that, that brings peace, and then you can enjoy the things around you. But there's too many wealthy people that, that have it all, guys, but yet they have nothing. They can't enjoy it. There are things that money cannot buy. There are diseases that money cannot heal. There was an icon in the world just died here not too long ago that uh, all the money in the world couldn't fix it. All the money in the world couldn't fix it. And that, that is there to remind us there are some things that only God can fix. That when we create a place, see the whole thing about tabernacles and even building the booth, it reminds us of several things. It reminds us that, we're, that this is temporary. We're just passing through. Really, in the look of, of, of things, how many know 100 years? Well, let me put it this way. The time that you get old enough to get it figured out, where you're actually thinking properly and doing properly, you're too old to do anything about it. Come on. We need more than 100 years. We need more than 80 years because usually it's about 50 or 60. You finally get over all the baggage of what you had in the past. You get, you, you get a lot of the he, wounds healed in your life. You start getting your life straightened out, and then you realize that you have maybe 10, 15, 20, 30 years, God, God willing, that you have left, but you're also too tired to do because when you're in your 20s and 30s and early 40s, you have plenty of energy, which means you're going and creating all these fires, creating all these messes, because you don't have the sense not to. And by the time you don't have the sense not to, you don't have the energy to do sometimes. That's why we need God. Because even, I, I look at Moses. 120, God. You mean I got to hand this stuff off to these young whippersnappers? I've not yet begun to see your glory. I want to go and I got some building to do. You see, Caleb, 80. Boys, move over. I'll take the mountain. I'll show you how to whoop some Philistines and how to whoop some Gentiles. And that's my mountain. And you just back off because I've been wandering around for 40 years waiting for you guys to finally grow up to the place I could go over there. You see, when you walk with God, age isn't the problem. I want I want, I want that tabernacling. I want God to come and, and to dwell here to strengthen this flesh because I got things to do. You know, I've ha I thought I had things to do in the past, but there were things to mess up. I got some things to straighten out now. I got, I got some things to deposit, but I've got to have the strength to do it. And the only way that can happen, when God tabernacles, God strengthens. When God comes on the scene, he begins to strengthen his people while he judges the very things that were tearing them up. Can, can you guys see that? That's where, th this is the year that it begins. This is the year. As God judges, God's going to strengthen because he is, gonna, he is going to judge the things that have been tearing this nation apart. He's going to be judging the things that are trying to tear the world apart. And at the same time, he's going to strengthen his people. So God's got his eye on, th this year is the year of strength. We need to cry out for God to strengthen us, spirit, soul, and body. Strengthen our minds to the word of God. Strengthen our minds to be resolute that I'm not going to let the past dictate my future. 
in any way. Not only my mistakes, but what people have thought of me or what people have done to me. That is not going to establish my future. My future is going to be established because God's come here to tabernacle with me and he's come to change some things. He's come to empower some things. And then I'm not going to be satisfied until I see the name of God reverenced again. First by God's people and then by the world. I want him to come and show himself strong. Guys, if we'll seek his face on it, he'll do it. There is an open window for us not only to become strong in God, but for God to become strong for us. Because he's going to come and visit and see. Father, we just thank you this morning for your word. Father, we thank you that we have a season that we may feel like David at Ziglag, that the enemy came and the enemy stole everything. And we would just like, if, if we could just do what we really wanted to do, it would be just to set in to cry and just to give up. But the word tells us that David strengthened himself in the Lord and that he sought your face. And the word that came back is you're going to overtake the enemy and you're going to recover all. And Father, that's the word for this hour, that if, that if we choose to inquire of the Lord and to seek for you to tabernacle among us, that everything that was stolen from us, Father, whether it was our well-being, Father, our wealth, our health, uh, whatever the woundedness have, has caused in past times, Father, that if we seek you, that everything those things strategically tried to steal from us, Father, that you're going to bring back, that we are without fail going to recover all. And then, Father, you're going to bring us to the place as we walk in the, in the way of holiness, that no evil can come there, that you have a path of divine protection that this generation has never yet seen, but it's going to begin to be released in the hearts of your people this coming year. We thank you. And we praise you for it. In Jesus' name.